Good afternoon. Welcome to my channel. Um, I'm here again to tell you a story based on five random words. Um, and those random words, which have been se selected by an online text generator, are as follows. Um, this story is the 54th, I believe, in the sequence. Uh, I'm going to try and get to 100 if I can. Uh, and it is called, so I'm just finished cleaning my glasses here. It is called Diving for Pearls. Also, um, it's a little bit longer than usual, but um, just felt it, it couldn't, I couldn't squeeze this one easily down to a thousand words. So it's more like 1500. Anyway, here we go. Diving for Pearls. It was a boardroom meeting like any other, as Maxwell Strang outlined the company's new strategies for diversification and vertical integration, when a strange and chilling sense of dislocation came over him. It began to feel like it was not he, chief executive officer of one of the, Europe's largest logistics and shipping companies, who was giving the presentation, but another 45-year-old man going slightly paunchy around the middle, aching in inexplicable places, tired all the time and bored out of his mind, someone he now viewed with pity. He watched this man talk, projecting bullish confidence as he concluded and handed over to his second-in-command, Miss Isla MacDonald, Director of Sales. This man, this multi-billionaire who'd made his fortune in shipping containers and now was fighting off the new competition from drone logistics with aplomb, was dead inside, a husk, animated and made to look alive and functional by a mere force of habit. As the applause rang in his ears and he took the usual firm handshakes and back slaps, Maxwell knew that something radical had to change, not in the world, not in his business, but simply in him. He was literally dying of boredom. When he got home that evening to his empty house, recently stripped clean of the last effects of his ex-wife, Kept pristine by a small army of cleaners, maintenance men and personal assistants, Maxwell took off his thousand dollar suit and poured himself a bubble bath. He spoke to the walls, requesting his favourite playlist on Randomize. A familiar bittersweet melody rippled through the concealed speakers as Maxwell lowered his aching frame into the fragrant suds. A plaintive and familiar lyric followed the dramatic piano introduction. With all the will in the world, diving for dear life, when we could be diving for pearls. Then Chet Baker's plaintive trumpet replaced Elvis Costello's croon, and Maxwell found himself laughing. The thought was audacious and ridiculous. I can do anything I want. It was a sentiment echoed by his therapist, Dr Susan Fisher, who had phrased it as a question. What is it that's stopping you from being happy? He hadn't come close to being able to answer that question until now. Three weeks later, Maxwell Strang had made some big changes. As usual that Sunday, he'd met with his ex-wife Sally, with whom he maintained a brittle friendship for the sake of the kids. He'd worn a t-shirt and ripped jeans, brand new purchases, a look he'd never favoured because, in his own words, business never stops and a CEO leads by example. Are you having a midlife crisis? Sally had asked, almost as soon as he sat down. Maxwell smiled. I don't think so. I am resigning from the company, selling my shares, liquidating my assets, and moving on, though. Sally was dumbfounded. You're what? I'm going to go and become a pearl fisher in the Philippines. Now it was Sally's turn to laugh, until she noticed that Maxwell seemed deadly serious. You're not joking, are you? No, I'm not joking. Remember, I always loved diving at school. I spent half my swimming sessions picking coins up from the bottom of the pool. I still swim four times a week. It's the only place I'm truly happy. The conversation rapidly degenerated into an argument, as Maxwell had half suspected it would. Sally attempted to quash his enthusiasm by pointing out how dangerous pearl fishing was, particularly since Maxwell intended to do it the traditional way without breathing apparatus. Maxwell said he didn't care. He had spoken to a local traditional pearl fisherman, Danilo, himself almost 70, who still dived every day. Danilo would show him the ropes in exchange for a salary, 
and Maxwell would eventually take over his business and his crew of young, lithe divers. From Sally's perspective, the business opportunity seemed shaky at best. Nobody dies for pearls, Sally argued, exasperated. It's preposterous. They're made artificially these days on an industrial scale. Danilo does. Anyway, this isn't about money. I have enough cash for 10,000 lifetimes. When everyone had laughed at the actor Daniel Day-Lewis, who had taken some years out to learn the act of cobbling, or at Leonard Cohen for vanishing to a Buddhist retreat while his management embezzled away his funds, Maxwell had sympathy for these men. When what you love becomes merely what you do, perhaps it's time to do and love something else. In any case, Sally had been mollified somewhat when Maxwell said he'd be giving her almost all his liquidated assets to place in trust for her two boys currently in primary school. So here he was bobbing alongside a small boat with Danilo half a mile offshore in the Sulu archipelago, making sure his nose clip was firmly affixed and the small net bag and knife were present and correct. Around him, similar boats bobbed on the gentle currents as the sun baked the surface of the deep blue water to a deceptive, soupy warmth. Conditions were favourable, and Danilo crossed himself, asking his higher power to intervene and bring them luck. Maxwell heard the cries of the young fishers as they leapt off the boats and plunged to great depths in a single breath. The deep water crevices where the best oysters lay were 30 metres down, and the businessman in Maxwell was tempted to ask why Danilo's crew didn't use aqualongs, wetsuits or any other modern innovation that would make their lives considerably easier. It's not about making life easy, he thought, feeling a sudden welling up of panic. What the hell was he doing here? Moments later, Danilo tapped him on the shoulder and flipped into a dive with an agility that belied his 68 years. Maxwell followed suit, kicking down as hard as he could, feeling the water quickly cooling around his skin as he followed the blurry form of Danilo into the deep. Quickly his fear mutated into excitement as he saw the sea floor approaching and a ridge that at first seemed rocky but wasn't. Three weeks into his training they had still only progressed to 12 metres down but this was the first time he'd actually seen oyster beds. Danilo was already digging mollusks free and dropping them into the string bag around his neck, his eyes wide open in a manner that Maxwell still found uncanny. He squinted at the knobbly oyster bed before him and managed to prise three oysters free with his knife, then just had time to pop them into the bag before the pressure in his chest cavity and the internal voice of pure animal panic made him dive for the surface. When he hit air again, Maxwell gasped convulsively, yelling in triumph, and it has to be said, relief. Danilo stayed down for at least another minute longer, coming up only when his string bag was full and looking as relaxed as if he's just done a dozen lengths of the hotel pool. The men sat in the boat together whilst Jose, Danilo's eldest son, brought them fresh water and bite-sized portions of curried fish to snack upon. Maxwell watched in awe as Danilo made short work of prizing open the oysters while he ate. Of the sixteen the old man had found, not one contained a pearl. Danilo's face betrayed no disappointment at all. It's normal, he shrugged. Sometimes we go for days before we find one. Danilo's laissez-faire attitude impressed Maxwell, who had been troubled by impatience all his life. He managed to get his first oyster open after a little instruction from Jose. Inside was nothing but fleshy slime he was tempted to squeeze lemon juice over and consume, except these oysters weren't good for eating. Instead, following Danilo's lead, he dropped the bivalve back overboard. Hopefully it would root itself once more, or else form a tasty meal for some other predator. Maxwell's second oyster yielded nothing either, but his third, having proved the most recalcitrant, almost leapt out of his grasp as its shell gave way to reveal something shimmering amongst the grey-white flesh. Danilo and Jose yelled encouragement as Maxwell extracted his first pure natural pearl. It rolled in his palm, gleaming in the sunlight. Beginner's luck, he shrugged, smiling wider than he had in years. Danilo and Jose slapped him on his back and chattered excitedly about the pearl shape, smoothness and quality. It was the size of the tip of Maxwell's forefinger and he wondered at the process that had created this miraculous thing. A grain of sand or dust lodged in the mollusk's soft interior had been coated with layer upon layer of iridescent calcium carbonate 
until it formed this amazing, highly prized object. Maxwell Strang felt like he held in the palm of his hand something more precious than mere jewellery. He held his life there, liberated from its secret hiding place, from where it had been submerged for so long, unseen in the deep, dark crevices of the ocean. The end. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed that little story. Um, kind of feel a little bit like Maxwell's trying myself, searching for a, a meaning, or searching for a change that has to be made to my life to uh, make sense of it. Um, answers on a postcard. Anyway, I um, hope you enjoyed that. Um, you can subscribe if you wish, um, watch another one. Uh, share this story if you think others would enjoy it too. And I will see you soon. Bye-bye.